Shooter ready. Stand by. Saddle up for gunfighter life. Veteran owned. Warfighter approved. Gluten free. Sustainably harvested. Renewable. All the buzzwords, right? No, but to be serious, welcome to Gunfighter Life, the podcast where we talk about guns, gunfighting, tactics, the right way, with almighty God at the center, Judeo-Christian values, and real-world first-hand experience. No bio today. If you're listening to this Q&A, you probably are a fairly regular listener, unless you just tune in for the Q&As. In fact, on some other channels that I listen to, Sometimes the random Q&A shows are my favorite. Maybe that's the same way with you. If you want more of these shows, ask me more questions. On Spotify, there's a thing where you can ask me a question. Or you can go to goodshepherdtraining.com. Goodshepherdtraining.com. If you're listening on other platforms that don't let you do that. The preferred way is for both of us hopefully become a patron it's a mutually beneficial thing if you if you're listening to me you probably think this guy may have some idea what he's talking about he's been blessed with a lot of training and experience i would like to ask him about this lpvo versus that lpvo this recently came up with a patron this week and i spent quite a bit of time trying to help him like do i get the trigicon do i get the loophole what about if i go with like a two to seven versus an lpvo and this whole back and forth and Hopefully he found value in that. If you've ever been there and got analysis paralysis. Anyway, if you're a patron, you don't have to ask and see. Maybe he'll answer one of my questions on a Q&A episode a month or two later. In general, we have daily back and forth contact. We have an insider chat and also patrons can contact me one-on-one. Now, I don't generally get on there on Sabbath unless it's to post a sermon or something. On Sabbath, I'll rest, and if I'm doing a long stint off-grid without service, then I might go a little bit. But honestly, one of the few reasons I come back in to get service sometimes is to talk with the patrons. So if you want that kind of interaction, you want to be able to ask me a question and get actual feedback, become a patron, and you don't have to wait for one of these Q&As. You can just ask me a question. All right, enough of that. Let us roll into the Q&A episode. Now, this one is from Eddie Smith. Eddie Smith says, I agree on the 870. I had the same issues with mine. I polished the chamber with triple steel wool and replaced every spring with the police magnum pieces and a hardened extractor. It is reliable since. I think he means to say it, it has been reliable since then. Okay, that is great. I agree with that. I obviously he's replying to me, so I really like the 870. I should specify I really like the old 870s, the old police magnums, the old wing masters, the the older 870s are just rock solid workhorses. The new ones, no. And if you, you go back and listen to his email, he did all that work. He went out and bought a brand new 870 and did a bunch of work and spent a bunch of money. Well, I don't know about a bunch of money, but time and money to get this thing to be reliable. If you're buying an 870 from Remington, it should be reliable, no? That's my issue. I can't recommend them. I did a similar thing to mine when I bought mine, and I got it being really reliable. I polished the chamber. I'm aware of the better extractors and the better springs that are available for them. I got mine running reliable, but I'm still not going to recommend them. I'm not going to recommend that you go buy a gun and then do a bunch of work to it to make it reliable. Likely you could buy you know, a Springfield XD and do a bunch of work to it and make it halfway work right. Why would I recommend that? It's one thing if you're taking a chance on a used gun and you got to do some work to it, like replace a spring or... Or probably a good idea if you're buying like a used 1911 to replace the main spring and replace the recoil spring anyway. But that's because you're saving money on a used gun and you don't know it's past. If you're buying a brand new gun, I mean, I, I really love the old Remingtons, but come on, Remington. If you're putting out one of your flagship products, a new gun, it should work. You shouldn't have to get it and redo the chamber 
on a brand new gun, right? That that's not cool. And apparently it's common because it happened to me when I bought mine and it happened to this gentleman as well. I'm not saying you can't do that. You certainly can if you want to buy a brand new 870 Remington and do a bunch of work to it and replace a bunch of parts to get it to work right. Then certainly that is an option, especially if you just love the 870 and I do. But I'm not going to recommend that you buy one, especially when you can go for similar or less money and get a Mossberg 500, 590, or my other big recommendation is the Benelli Nova, Benelli Supernova. Why would I recommend the Remington when you could go and get a rock-solid, dependable, rugged, reliable pump-action shotgun in the same price point from another manufacturer? I, I just can't in good conscience do that. Again, if you want to buy one and put a bunch of work and time into it to get it to run reliably then hats off. There's nothing wrong with that. But for just a general recommendation, I still I can't recommend a new 870. If you are going to buy a new 870, what his email said was a good one. Polish the chamber, get a new extractor, replace some of those springs. And yeah, it's, it's still got a lot of the attributes of the old 870. One of them being, for me, and this is just me, and I've done... I've done trials like the 870 points better for me. It just does than the Mossberg. I, I just the way that it's made something like that. But again, I'm not going to recommend unless you unless you want to do the work and the time and put all that into a new gun. I'm not going to recommend that. I appreciate the email, Eddie. Now this next one. I don't always read like the attaboy emails. They do mean a lot to me and I do appreciate them. But this one really gets me excited because it's not really for me. I mean, I appreciate it. I appreciate that you guys letting me know that what I'm doing is making a difference. But I'm going to read this one because I think it's germane to all of you. And this is about the DIY armed citizen training, the DIY concealed carry training. Going to give it a try with my range buddy. We are going this week. That is... That, that means so much that people are actually doing it, right? Because you can listen all day long. You can listen all you want, but it's the doing that is actually going to make one a gunfighter. It's not, it's not the fact that you listen to stuff about guns. I, well, I don't want to put that on any other podcast, but the, one of the reasons I started this podcast, and there's nothing wrong with entertaining gun content, but... There's a lot of content out there from what I would call gun entertainers. And again, there's nothing wrong with that. If you want to know what guns were in video games or what guns were in movies or whatever, that's that's cool. But that does not make one proficient. That does not make one effective. And there's a lot of information out there about people that don't have a lot of real-world training and experience. right? I, I mentioned I, I do a, quite a bit of Patreon-only content. And I talk about stuff on there that I won't talk about on the air, right? I don't generally tell war stories and stuff, you know, to the general public. But I said in there, and this is true, I won't get into a lot of detail, but true that I have been shot at more times than I can remember. And that's honest. Like, if I sat down and went through year by year, month by month, and maybe I could figure out a rough idea of how many times I've been shot at, by God's grace, I'm still here. I've been shot at. Heck, I've been shot. I'm still here. Still standing. Still rucking, still running, still training, still shooting. If I can use that training and experience, that real world firsthand experience, right? Because I do this podcast not primarily to help me, right? I could just keep that to myself. I do it to help you guys. And if I can use that training and experience to help come up with some good training that the common man, the common serious armed citizen, not the guy that just has an LCP and carries it and shoots it once a year, but the actual serious, well-regulated citizen can do and become more proficient and become effective at defending himself, his loved ones, his neighbor, human life. Right? That, that means something to me, so I'm, I've read that one. I appreciate it. I appreciate everybody that goes out there and not just listens to the podcast. I appreciate that too. But if you, and sometimes I just give opinions, right? Like I like this thing and I don't like that thing and that's fine. But a lot, a lot of work 
and I'm not complaining, but a lot, a lot of work and trial, and you might say decades of training and experience and running different calls and shooting different calls and different training courses went into coming up with that. And it may seem like a simple course of fire, but a lot of thought and experimentation and trial and error went into that. So if you're actually getting out there and running that one or the one that's about to be released, the Modern Rifleman Course of Fire, so stand by for that. It may come out before or after this episode, um, so make sure you're subscribed. But if you actually get out there and run this stuff, that means a lot to me. I appreciate it. The next one, and this is from... <laughs> i be honest, I can't, I don't even know how to pronounce it. U-L-Y-N-G. Euling? My, my apologies if I'm not pronouncing that right. Um, Luke 22, 35 to 38. Funny how so many overlook this scripture. I'm going to read this scripture for you. You've probably heard me quote it before. Hopefully we don't overlook it here. On gunfighter life. By we I mean the royal we. Like you guys and myself. The the audience. Myself. The host. Hopefully we don't overlook this. So I'm going to read it. This is from the Gospel of Luke. Starting in verse 35. And he. The he right here is Christ Jesus. And he said to them. When I sent you without money bag. Knapsack and sandals. Did you lack anything? So they said nothing. Then he said to them, then he said to them, But now he who has a money bag, let him take it, and likewise a knapsack, and he who has no sword, let him sell his garment and buy one. For I say to you that this which is written must be accomplished in me. And he was numbered with the transgressors, for the things concerning me have an end. So they said, Look, here are two swords. And he said to them, It is enough. Yes, I think many who would call themselves Christians, and it's not my place to judge whether somebody is a Christian or not, but many, I think, have a skewed view. And and let me be real, none of us, not you and not me, have a perfect view view of God. We cannot perfectly comprehend a infinite, infallible, all-powerful God. But we shouldn't intentionally leave out parts of the Bible that we don't like. right? How, how often, if you read your Bible often and you're honest with yourself, how often do you read your Bible and you just get slapped in the face or just cut deep? You know what I'm talking about. Like, oh, that's me. I'm screwing up there. Right? And and we shouldn't shy away from parts of the Bible that make us uncomfortable. And I think many, sadly, have a tendency to do that. God is beautiful and rich in mercy, abundant in mercy. God also has wrath, right? Jesus tells his disciples to have swords. He also chastises them. This is where gunfighter life, you may agree with this one and not look at the other one, but Jesus tells his disciples to have swords, yes. He also chastises Peter when he uses his sword wrongly. He doesn't tell him to get rid of his sword, right? A lot of people would use that verse to say that, see, see, you're not supposed to use it. He doesn't tell him to get rid of his sword. He tells him to put it back in its place. If he's carrying it on him, his place is its sheath because that wasn't the right time. That wasn't the right use of force. But he tells them to have swords. Swords are not for, you know, spreading butter on biscuits. Swords are not for cleaning one's fingernails. A sword is a weapon. Jesus has, tells his disciples to have swords. And, obviously, Jesus knows all. His disciples already had swords. His disciples were walking around armed. All right, so, yeah, I think it's good to have a sober view of the Bible. A sober view of God, of Christ. All right. Moving on from I Buy Drums. For home defense, carry fun. I have a P229 Legion, P365XL, Smith 586. Per your advice, pondering a shotgun. What's your opinion on the $100 single shot 
Turkey imports, like the RIA, Nomad, etc. Thanks. No, thank you, I buy drums. Sounds like you got a pretty good battery of handguns there. I have a rough idea of what those handguns cost, so I'm going to come back to that later. But let me address your actual question. What's your opinion of the $100 single-shot Turkish imports, like RIA, Nomad, etc.? Okay, I don't have experience with that particular one. Turkey makes a ton of guns. Turkey makes some really good guns. Turkey makes some other guns. <laughs> to bit it politely, right? Turkey actually can make some really good shotguns. Here's the thing. Be real with yourself, right? If you think that you're going to go out and buy the Turkish copy of a Benelli M4 that costs two grand or whatever they cost now with inflation, if you think you're going to get one of those for a couple of hundred bucks, a Turkish knockoff, and think that it's going to be just as good, you know, that's like going to a guy in a back alley and buying a $50 Rolex and expecting it to be an actual Rolex. It's, it's not that. So be real. The single shot Turkish shotguns, they have their place, right? I own one. I have one. I hunt with one. I like having it. I like I like it as a good beater utilitarian shotgun. I think a single shot break open boss, break open single shot shotgun is one of the most utilitarian guns. I'm I'm more accepting of those in the Turkish made because they're so simple and they've been made for so long. So what do I think about the single shot Turkish shotguns, many of them? I think they're a great value for the money. I think if you don't have a shotgun, you should definitely have one. If that's that's definitely better than no shotgun. I don't think you'd ever regret having one. I have many other shotguns. I have oh, I'm blessed to have a great battery of shotguns. And I still am glad that I have the old single shot, right? If I'm if my wife's going on a road trip or something, I put it in her trunk with an assortment of shells. If I'm going out in some really nasty, disgusting environment, I'll take that shotgun. But it's not a survival scenario. I'm just going out to go out in some nasty environments. Also, if I just want to challenge myself, right? Hunting with a single shot is harder. Those are my thoughts on that. Now, let me get back to you. You have good taste in handguns, right? You have some really nice handguns. I know what a 229 Legion costs because I carry, often my, my best carry gun is a 226 Legion. All right, so I know what you're spending on that. Man, come on. For, is, is, are the single shot Turkish shotguns a good value? Yes. Would you regret owning one? No. But it sounds to me like you really, really like combat handguns. Good for you. I, I'm not saying that facetiously. I mean, that's awesome. But you, you mentioned home defense, right? Step up a little bit. And not a lot, right? You can go out and get a not Turkish import knockoff. You can get, it's still American made, but the budget version of a Mossberg 500. You can get the Maverick 88, which is pump action. So you get repeatable and a reasonable rate of fire. You're talking, what, 200, 200 and some dollars? Come on, let's be real. What is that compared to a SIG 229 Legion? And that's going to be a better home defense gun than the best home defense handgun on the planet, period. It's going to be better than a Mark 23 with a silencer and armor penetrating explosive tip ammunition, which I'm just, just being ridiculous there to prove a point. It's still going to be better than that. A Maverick 88 pump action shotgun with number four buck loaded up is a better home defense tool, period than the fanciest, bestest, coolest, tacticalest handgun. Are you in this to actually defend home? Or are you in it to have cool toys that you justify by saying, oh, it's my home defense handgun? I'm just being real with you. You have good taste in handguns. But that's not the right tool for the job. A handgun is limited in firepower. If you're going to a gunfight, you only bring a handgun if that's all you can have or it's a very specialty situation like you're crawling in a tunnel. Right? You don't show up to a gunfight if you can help it with a handgun. Unless that's all, again, unless that's all you have. And that's why we have handguns. Let's remember, we have handguns because it's not socially acceptable or logistically acceptable, prudent, to have a long gun. 
if you told me I was going to have to get into a gunfight today to protect somebody else's life and I couldn't, if, if me not showing up was going to cause the death of other people and I had to show up to it, depending on what the arena looked like, I might have to really think about the shotgun versus the rifle, but I wouldn't just go with a handgun. Right? It's, it's, a, it's a limited thing. You have a handgun because you cannot have a rifle or a shotgun. If you can have a rifle or a shotgun, have a rifle or a shotgun. I think the Turkish $1 imports are great. I think everybody should probably have a beater shotgun. But if you have all those handguns and no shotgun, probably step up a little bit. Because I don't think you would... I also don't think that you would regret having a Maverick 88. You could also... Uh, it's just... that That's my advice to you personally. If all you have is the money for a break-open single-shot shotgun... Or you have a good repeatable firepower shotgun and you just want a beater shotgun, a loner shotgun. Those single shots are great. I can only attest as far as Turkish imports, the Hatfield. Why? Because they sell it at Walmart. I bought one. Just kind of to beat the crap out of it, honestly, and to see how it was. I was impressed with it. It's the Hatfield. And again, there are a lot of different importers and not all Turkish imports are of equal quality. But that's my thoughts on that Hatfield. It's pretty good for the money. And those are my thoughts overall. Um, and hopefully you appreciate that. I'm not here just to tell you what you want to hear. I'm here to speak the truth. Maybe ruffle some feathers, but you got some really nice handguns. That's a that's a really good set of practical handguns. But a handgun is not the right tool for every job. Anyway, with that, appreciate you. Oh, and I hope you listen because here's the thing about the Spotify asking questions. That's really cool. But it doesn't give me a back and forth. It's like you post something on there. It's more like a review. Like I can't sit there and write back to you. So hopefully you listen to this. And that's for all of you guys. So just know that if you write one, you got to listen to the Q&As. Because it's not like a back and forth thing. The, the back and forth is you writing me and me talking about it on the podcast. This one's username is quit copying my username. <laughs> all right. What shotgun shells do you suggest for hunting large, medium, small game? That may seem like a simple question. It is not a simple question. Uh, I've said this before, um, but perhaps I should really, really dive into it right now. Shotguns are so individualistic, right? Shotguns and 22s are probably the most individualistic, meaning you could have two shotguns come off the line. Same, both, both Mossberg 500s. One could pattern extremely well with the exact same shell, and one could pattern atrociously with the exact same load. They are very individualistic. I've used this analogy a little bit before, but or a similar analogy. Let's say you, not for casual dating, but let's say you're courting, you've courted in the past a blonde-haired, blue-eyed girl, 5'3", 110 pounds. And she really liked punk rock and spicy food. That relationship doesn't work out you... You still want to get married. You start courting again, and you meet another. What did I say? Five foot three, hundred and ten pound, blonde hair, blue eyed girl. Don't assume that she likes punk rock and spicy food. She might hate spicy food, and she might hate punk rock. She might like country music and old school Americana food, like chicken and biscuits. There's nothing wrong with that. Or you have to don't assume that. That shotgun is going to like that thing. Shotguns are very individualistic. So don't be lazy here. Get out and pattern. You have to pattern your shotgun when fired by you and your choke. And I think a lot of people don't really understand how important that is with a shotgun. You could have two a real ubiquitous, real common load. Nine pellet double up buck. You could have two nine pellet double up buck loads. And one could pattern really, really well, and you could have an effective range on a deer out to 50 yards. And the other one could pattern atrocious, and you, your effective range might be 20 yards. It, the, the difference is that dramatic. All right, it couldn't be that dramatic. Uh, case in point, I, I had a shotgun that I sold because I just, again, this was I, this is a learning process for me to write this. I bought this shotgun who knows how long ago, a long time ago, and then I sold it. And I assumed that all shotguns were this awesome. It was a Benelli M1 Super 90. It was a, just a great gun. 
it was no choke. It was cylinder bore, right? It had no restriction in the barrel, which some people would tell you is a horrible thing. That thing would keep every single pellet of double lot buck with certain loads on a USPSA silhouette at 50 yards. Every single pellet would stay on that. I did not realize how special that was. Okay. Also, you didn't mention what gauge. I'm going to assume you mean 12 gauge. Moving on from that, you got to test your load because I tell you that load X is good does not mean it's good out of your shotgun, right? You have to test this. I will give you some loads. Let's start small and work our way up. Talking dove and quail, like that size small. Generally seven and a half or eight shot. And remember shot goes in the inverse order. So the bigger the number, the smaller the shot. So, you know, eight is smaller than seven and a half. Seven and a half or eight, seven and a halves and eights are generally very common. Those are good for your smaller game. You move up into a little bit larger small game, things like squirrel and rabbit and pheasant. I like number six, number six shot. It's a pretty good all around shot. In fact, if I could only have like one size shot for sub, sub deer size animal, right? I would probably take number six shot, but you probably want smaller shots so you don't tear stuff up with the like a it's not ideal for dove and quail for that seven and a half or eights now let's move to the larger game obviously you have a big bifurcation here right you have slugs if you're talking about a regular shotgun you have foster slugs and you have bernecki slugs here in america by far foster slugs are more common so let's focus on the foster slug you're talking 12 gauge get a one ounce foster slug that your gun likes that shoots point of aim point of impact and again this is very individualistic so you got to test it and try it buy a couple of different kinds of slug and shoot them and see which one your gun likes but there isn't really much in north america that a one ounce foster slug what the old timers would call a pumpkin ball if you do your part and put that slug in the right place there's nothing in north america that that slug will not kill in fact, it's one of the go-to recommended things for guides in Alaska. I actually prefer Bernecki slugs, but they're harder to find. But but 12-gauge, 1-ounce slug, full-powered 1-ounce slug is a formidable thing, and it will kill anything here in America that you want to kill with it. So that that's period. If you're talking about buckshot, I actually differ from the norm. I said that double-up buck 9-pellet is the most common, and it is. It is. It's a, it's a very proven military and police load, and I will sometimes use it. But I prefer, for home defense and for medium-sized game hunting, number four buck. Number four buck gives you a lot more pellets. You get nine pellets of double lot, generally, unless you move to like a magnum shell, in which case you might get 12. With just a standard shell, you generally get 27 pellets. And if you move up to a magnum shell in number four buck, you get 41 pellets. Now you're stepping down from, I believe, 33 caliber to 24 caliber, if memory serves correct. But you get a lot more pellets. And somebody that's done a lot, a lot of hunting with a shotgun. For deer size game, I really like number four buck. For any of the buckshot loads, if you can get a flight control wad, if you are shooting it out of a more open choke, meaning more open than modified, like cylinder bore or an open barrel, then you really might want to look at the flight control stuff. But those are some of my suggestions. Please, please, please don't just go buy a box of Walmart slugs and go out deer hunting without actually patterning them in your gun. Right? You have no idea. They could shoot wildly left, wildly right, high, low, whatever. Right? You have to do homework. Just like you got a sight in a rifle, you got to pattern slash sight in a shotgun. But those are some suggestions. Again, real quick recap. I appreciate the question. It's just a lot more complex, I think. I wish I could just give you an easy answer and be like, oh, buy, buy Remington Green Box number six shot. But for very small game like doves and quail, seven and a half or eights, for your larger small game, pheasants, rabbit, things like that, number six shot is good. And then for buckshot, I like number four, but double lot is just fine and probably a lot more common. And a slug that your gun shoots and likes. So that's some suggestions. The next one from Cora, Cura Hevet. As you say, depends. 
However, my go-to GP, I assume that's general purpose, is going to be the AR. Light, adequate for the job, ubiquitous ammo, can connect at 500 meters with proper ammo, such as 77 grain, SMK. Those hits will count. And he's generally, obviously, giving me some feedback on a general purpose rifle. And there's nothing wrong with that. Um, the AR is probably the most common choice if I told people you can only grab one fighting rifle and head out the door it's probably going to be some form of ar and that's fine right there is a reason why for the past 50 years and even longer for the soviet version that the ar and ak have been the go-to battlefield weapons as far as infantry small arms for decades and decades and decades and although they may be looking at and they say they are and we'll We'll see if it actually goes through or not. I don't see the future. Replacing it with the M7, which is a... It smells a lot like an AR, but it's a bigger, beefier version with a different operating system. But there's a reason why they lasted so long. And I mentioned this briefly in a Patreon episode that I recorded yesterday. We live in the golden age, right? There are so many good ARs on the market now for such good prices... Even if an AR is not your go-to, you probably should have a good fighting AR. A good general purpose AR setup. And by that I mean like not one with a giant magnified scope on there for hunting prairie dogs or something like that. But a good general purpose and pick your flavor. You want a red dot, you want an LPVO, a good sling, a, a good fighting rifle setup. But I appreciate that. Moving on. This next one. Henry Buford, this is, you know, what's your go-to carry gun? He says Glock 19, contemplating moving to a 17 and a 14.5 PNW 5.56. Let's go back to the Glock 19, Glock 17 thing. Yes. Yes. Go to the Glock 17. I know that the Glock 19 is probably more common, especially for civilians, probably not if you count military and law enforcement, than the Glock 17. But anything that the Glock 19 will do, the 17 will do better except conceal. Everything is a trade-off, right? I, I'm i blessed to uh, have somebody that just got into concealed carry and, and they got a hold of me and they're asking all these questions. And they're like, what I want is a super small gun that shoots really, really well. That That's like the complete inverse of the relationship, right? You could have a really big gun that you don't shoot well or whatever, but in general, that's not how that works. Smaller handguns are harder to shoot. In general, there are some exceptions. But that's like me saying... I live as a nomad, a neo-nomad. It'd be like me saying, yeah, I want a Porsche, super small and subcompact and easy to park in the city, but I want it to be able to haul livestock and I want it to be able to haul my camper. Right? You can't have both. So if you're talking about from a shooting standpoint, and plus, plus capacity, shooting standpoint, grip, the ability to clear malfunctions, all that is better on the 17. If you can carry and conceal a 17, and I've, I have a lot of experience with the Glock 17. Go with the 17. Here's what you can do if you're handy with... And this this kind of ticks me off about the Glock 19X because it's the complete opposite of what I would want. It's a short, stubby slide with the extended grip. I would want the opposite of that for carry because I carry the gun-oriented muzzle down, strong side hip generally. So I would rather have the full-size slide and the compact grip because that would make it easier to conceal. However, we're talking a very little difference in the grip size. So if you can just carry a 17, carry a 17. But what you might do if you have the fortitude for it and you're not worried about messing it up and you're handy with a Dremel, if you're an actual gunfighter, you probably have a Dremel. And if not, you're probably thinking about getting a Dremel. But if you're handy with a Dremel and some cutoff wheels, always start lower than you think because you can always take off more material but you can't add more you can turn that 17 into the 19 size grip and assuming you carry it on your belt it's going to conceal pretty much the same because who cares how long the slide is if it's going vertically and you could have what i would consider a more practical gun than the 19x i know a lot of people love the 19x anyway yeah the glock 17 i definitely prefer it over the glock 19 for everything other than concealability and in general if i'm moving smaller i would go to the glock 26 which is even smaller than the 19 
But anyway, those are my thoughts. But obviously the Glock 19 is a very, very popular carry gun and a good all-around gun. If you could said you could only have one Glock, first of all, if you said you had to carry a Glock, because I'd probably pick something else, but if you said you had to have a Glock and you could only ha ever have one Glock for all the things, the Glock 19 is not a bad option because it's that in-between, that middle size. Now, I didn't read all of them. Some of them weren't posed as a question, but if I saw a question in there, I would read them. And if you just want to post something like what your carry gun is, like one guy just said a MMP Shield M40, that's great. Let everybody know what you are carrying. That's kind of one of the points of that. That way we can all kind of look and see what what, what is common for carry. But I don't. there's not much I'm going to be able to... There's no real question there. I appreciate... All of you guys, I got a lot more questions this month than normal, which by God's grace, the podcast is growing, especially in listenership. If you are a regular listener and you have not yet subscribed, subscribe slash follow the show, right? It's free. It doesn't going to cost you anything. Also, again, if, if you find the feedback valuable, if you value the opinion, if you you may disagree, and you should disagree with some of the stuff that I say, right? You should not agree with me 100% all the time. I am not Christ. I am not infallible. I make mistakes. But if in general you value my opinion, knowing that I make mistakes as any fallible human does, you might want to consider becoming a patron. We have, well, they have, they can just interact with me whenever. Patrons get a lot faster, more concise access to me than the general public, as you might imagine. I also put out for them quite a bit of insider content, sometimes just fun content like Guns for Bigfoot, right? Just a fun episode, Guns for the Zombie Apocalypse, which you might, you know, really enjoy because you can take that and apply it to something that's actually practical, like Guns for Really Big Animals or Guns for Bear Defense or the zombie apocalypse is kind of, you know, seen in the prepper world as a euphemism for not actually a zombie apocalypse, but if things get really, really bad, right? We're in the peanut butter and chocolate hits the fan. But also, I give them a lot of insider content that I consider really useful. And I'll talk about and be more real as far as going deeper and talking about things I wouldn't normally talk about on the podcast because I consider that a smaller circle, a tighter circle. Anyway, if you want to be a part of that and you want to support the show, consider becoming a patron. All the other things too, right? American, small business, veteran owned, veteran one, or veteran run, right? How small? Employee number one, this guy. You want to support something like that. It really does make a difference. Tactical tip of the day. Hopefully many of you out there are hunters. Hopefully many of you are blessed with a successful harvest. And here in America, most commonly of deer meat, but you can do this with venison or many other meats. If you don't normally listen to Alpha Male Podcast, I do another podcast, Alpha Male Podcast, and I put things there not entirely about guns. I just did one on meatistry or being a meat smith or whatever you want to call it, going above and beyond butchering, making like some really good artisan sausage. I am Italian, as you might deduce from my name. Melito is Latin, literally Latin for soldier. It is where you get the words we have in our language of militia and military. Melito, that's my name, the masculine form of militia. So let me give you a good artisan Italian venison recipe. Whole dried red pepper if you can get it and then you chop up chunks of green pepper onion and whole garlic cloves and here's what I like to do also oregano and rosemary whatever other Italian seasonings you might want to put in there you run the meat through the grinder really coarse I we have a hand grinder run it through one time really coarse like barely grinding it and then you run it through your vegetables like your onions and your whole cloves of garlic to grind those up then you mix it all up in a bowl with your smaller ingredients that will need to be ground like your basil or your rosemary you add those to the bowl then you also add some olive oil why olive oil one italian right come on but two most game meat and i said most if you're doing this with lamb you pro you don't need it 
But most game meat is really lean. A good healthy fat is olive oil. You mix in the olive oil, I would say about 15%. You mix that in. And then you run it through the grinder again to get it more homogeneous, a good mixture. Like you mix it in the bowl by hand and you throw it in the grinder again. You can put it in casings if you want, or you can just put it in little patties and wax paper. But, I mean, just like if you order that kind of sausage, like spicy Italian venison sausage at a restaurant, who knows what that would cost, right? I don't generally go out to eat at fancy restaurants. You can make really fancy, really healthy, great food with wild game meat. My wife and I were blessed last night. I went, uh, if you guys care about my own personal life, I went with Alexander Hamilton, our Rhodesian Ridgeback, trying to teach him to do some upland bird hunting. And we were successful. Last night, we were blessed to have quail and spicy southwest venison sausage and eggs for dinner. Very, very... Oh, plus we forage... Well, we... I... We were blessed to forage uh, pear and apple. Right, you don't always need to make a ton of money to eat like a king. It was... I, better than anything from any restaurant around here that I would have gotten. And healthier. So, anyway, there, it's a quick recipe for some good artisan sausage. With that, your tactical verse of the day. This is coming at you from Deuteronomy 13. The Lord may turn from the fierceness of his anger and show you mercy, have compassion on you, and multiply you, just as he swore to your fathers. Remember, talked about this a little bit earlier. God is rich in mercy, but he also has wrath. We're called to fear one thing in life as Christians, one thing, and that's it, and that's God. A healthy respect and reverence and awe for an almighty, all-powerful God. And he has wrath. And we deserve that wrath. And the only reason we don't get that wrath is because of his mercy. God who is rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us. Even when we were dead in our trespasses made us alive together in Christ. We deserve wrath. It is the saving blood of Christ that washes us clean from our sin. Remember what's important, men. Have a blessed day.